CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm Tommy Grimes. Do you remember the first ghost story you ever heard? Did it spook you? My grandfather told me this one, and when I asked him where it came from, all he would say was, from the old country. That was all I had to hear, and so I had to track it down. And I did, and discovered quite a bit Grandpa never told me. I know it will intrigue you as much as it always has intrigued me, and I can hardly wait to begin a good, scary hour. How extraordinary it is, Professor. What life and afterlife have in store. I was a general. I accepted death as I accepted life. Chancy and inevitable. I never dreamed there could be more. Did you, Professor? General, I'll say this. As a professor, what is happening to us right now is unthinkable. I still don't understand it. It it seems such a waste of time. Professor, what use is time to us? Time, which is so valuable to the living, doesn't even exist here. Our mystery drama, The Way Station, based on a story by Ferenc Molnar was written especially for the Mystery Theatre by G. Frederick Lewis and stars Norman Rose. I shall be back shortly with Act One. Let me set the scene. High on a hill overlooking the Danube River is the town of Calaman. A church bell tolls mournfully. The occasion, the burial of the mother of Stefan and Judith. Have you ever noticed that the skies take on the color of the event? Today is no exception. The gray and black clouds are almost as dark as the clothes of the bereaved. Peter, the husband of the dead woman, shovels the earth into the grave of the one who was once his beloved wife. Come, Judith. It's over. Come, sister. Stefan, why don't you and I together take your sister home? Uh, thank you, Doctor. Could I, yes. Uh, just a moment. I'm forgetting something. After all, you and your sister are young. Look at your father standing there next to his shovel. Perhaps I had better stay with him. Peter. Peter! You see what I mean, Stefan? He's just standing there, stricken. I can't think of any worse fate than being the only grave digger in the village and... Having to bury your own wife. Oh, please, please, can't we go home now? Oh, my dearest Judith, of course we can. I can't stand a moment longer in the cemetery. Dr. Kadali, I'm sorry. I must go. I can't understand why my mother... She was so young. Why? Why? Judith's medicine did everything possible to save her. It was the Lord's will. Oh, that's what I don't understand. Why did the Lord will it that my mother should die? You mean you haven't seen Father since the burial, Dr. Coday? After we brought your sister back to the house and I gave her something to calm her nerves, I went back to the graveyard to look for him. But he wasn't there. You must try to understand, Stefan. Difficult as it is for you and Judith, twin children, to lose your mother to this terrible plague, it is doubly difficult for a man to lose his wife. I wish he'd come home. I know what he's doing. He's walking through the woods, even now when it's dark. Oh, oh, Judith, I'm I'm glad you're out. Uh, Come in. How do you feel? How are you, my child? Did you give me something to make me sleep? To relax you from the strain, yes. Uh, sit down, dear. How long have I been asleep? A few hours. It's only several. Where's Father? Uh, well, we were just wondering. I think he's walking somewhere outside. 
He didn't come back to the house? No. <sighs> it's 7 o'clock. Has anybody eaten? No, no, Judith. Stephen and I have been sitting here waiting for your father to return. Oh, I'll go into the kitchen and see what I can put together for a supper. Can you stay, Dr. Kadali? Oh, certainly. I am not leaving until I've had the chance to talk to Peter. Oh, it's almost too impossible to believe. Four days ago, Stefan and I came home for the spring holiday, and Mother was walking around, planning to make new curtains, sweeping the floors as she does every day. And the very next day, she got so ill, we had to put her to bed. I have seen the plague end the person's life in a matter of hours. Nothing could be done. I, I came here as quickly as I could. Oh, Doctor, we're not blaming you. I know you did everything possible. Judith, I've been thinking. Don't you think that Father should get away from here, move out of his house? Oh, I can't say. It depends on how he feels. What do you think, Doctor? Oh, I can't possibly even guess what he'll do. Peter, your father, is a strange person. He was always very quiet, kept to himself. He always liked working with his hands. That's how he became a carpenter. And he did very well for a long time. Built some of the best houses in Kalaman. And then he saw an opportunity to do even better. And he branched out and made coffins. Oh, Peter, we were just talking about you. Oh, Father, I'm just going to make us all some supper, all right? Yes, child, that would be very nice. You go ahead. So you were talking about me, were you? I was worried, Father. You understand, it's it's been hours since the funeral. And I had things to do. And uh, what were you saying, Kodali? Oh, not very much. The youngsters asked me about you, Peter, and since we grew up together... I uh, didn't know you built all the big houses around here, Father. You knew I was a carpenter? Oh, I, I guess so. And from there, I went on to making coffins. There was good money in that until people wanted to buy those fancy ones with the bronze handles lined with red and white satin. So they bought their coffins in Budapest. Mm. And then you became a grave digger. Oh, somebody had to do it. I was always interested in the church, and the deacon asked me if I would. Most cemeteries have two grave diggers, but I could do it all alone, even to lowering the coffin after I had made the grave. Stefan, why don't you go into the kitchen and help your sister with the meal? I uh, would like to talk to your father alone. Oh, I'd be glad to. I uh, can't say I'll be much help, but uh, at least I know how to keep out of her way. Stefan, you're just in time. Oh. You keep stirring this soup, will you? I'd be glad to make myself useful. How's father? Uh, well, that's why I came in here. Um, Dr. Koday said, Stefan, go in and help your sister in the kitchen. I want to talk to your father alone. Oh, maybe he's going to talk to him about selling the house. Oh, I know I could never come back here to live. Now, you and I have a whole semester to think about that. In the meantime, living in Budapest near the university is the best thing. Well, if you want to know the truth... Oh, I know this is terrible to say about one's own father, and digging graves is as honorable a profession as anyone could want. It's something that has to be done, but... Oh, Stefan, I've never been happy about what father does for a living. And I don't know what I can do about it. Oh, oh keep stirring. I don't want the soup burned. I am uh, so sorry. I can't stay for supper. Judas, Stefan... I must go. And don't come back, Cordalia. Do you hear me? Your father and I have had words. I am afraid I have upset him. I'll stop by tomorrow afternoon. Uh, Doctor, uh, Judith and I are going back to Budapest in the morning. We had examinations. Interfering old fool. Get out, Cordalia. You don't know anything and you never did. Good night. Good night. I'm sorry this sad day had to end like this. Uh, father, what do you say to you? I... I should sell this house. I should move away. I should leave Kalaman, I suppose. What is he talking about? My retiring from the human race? Uh, father, I'm sure he meant no harm at all. He, he was only thinking of you living alone in this house. If I sell this house, where would I go? To another house. And if you wanted to stay in Kalaman, there's a nice section way at the other end of town. What good would that be? It would take me much longer to get to work. Here, I... I am across the road from the church and the cemetery. 
If it rains or snows, it does not matter. I am right here to do the grave digging. No, that is settled now. You two, you stay here tonight, and then I want you back on the train to the city in the morning and into your classes. Now, there is one thing you children must understand. For me, Magda, my dearest darling Magda, has not died. What I placed in that wooden box and put into the earth was not your mother. It was flesh, perhaps, but her spirit is still very much in this house. I can understand how you feel. No, you cannot. You are just saying that. It is not a feeling. It is the truth. But I will put it to you in a way I think both of you can understand. I do not wish to move from this house. Not now. Not ever. I want to be able to cross the road any time I like and mow the grass around her or, or change the flowers. Yes, I believe her spirit lives. I will never be without her. Never. I can promise you that. Knock again, Stefan. Well, I have been knocking. If Father's in the house, he would have heard well, me. Well, he could have gone out. Well, he hardly ever goes out. He's not in the cemetery. We looked. I don't understand it. Didn't he expect us to come back out here this weekend? Didn't you tell him he would? Well, I thought I did, but I guess I forgot. I just assumed that a week after Mother died, he'd expect us to come home. And what's more peculiar is that he's always left the front door open. Why is it locked? I think I've got a spare key in one of my pockets. I know. He may have gone to visit Dr. Kodali. Uh, Stephen, knock just once more, please. Uh, Judy, Stefan, what are you doing here? What's the matter, Father? Don't you want to see us? Are you, uh, having a party? What are you two talking about? Well, I, I see you got a tray with a bottle of wine and two glasses. Uh, no, three, and, um, three plates of soup. Is Dr. Kodai here? What business is it of yours? What are you two doing spying on me? Father, what do you mean spying? We came specially from the university. Go away. I have many things to do. I cannot entertain you. Go away. Go away. Well... What do you make of that? What did we say to him to, to make him so angry? I don't know. But I'm frightened. All I did was ask if Dr. Kodai was here because he had a tray of soup and wine. I want to get into the house, Stefan. Father needs us. I know it. It's Mother's death that's brought this on. <sighs> He's locked it again. He has locked us out. Did, uh, did you find your key? Uh, uh, yeah, I have it right here. Go on, Stefan. I'm off the yeah, door. I am. I am. I am. The worst thing of all is not what he said, but how he looked. Uh, uh, what? Stefan, didn't you notice? Didn't you see? Exactly what? Father's hair has turned completely white. The combination to the secret vault that holds the unknown land of death and the known land of those left behind to mourn has yet to be unlocked. My most favorite poet of all time called it that undiscovered country from whose bourne no traveler returns. Indeed, it is just that. And what market will leave upon this little family of father, daughter, and son we shall learn when shortly I return with Act Two. Peter is the town grave digger and grave caretaker in a small village high above the Danube. It has been his unfortunate task to bury his wife, who succumbed to the plague that swept over Europe in the 18th century. His son and daughter, Stefan and Judith, study at the university. And a week after the funeral, return home to find their father so strange and secretive, they begin to wonder if his wife's death has not affected his mind. What time is it now, Stefan? Uh, it's almost 11 at night. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to explain all this. He locks the front door, then opens it. Finally, he treats us like unwanted strangers and slams the door in our face. Oh, my poor father. And I've seen that distant, almost 
disembodied look on Father's face before. I'm trying to remember, have, have I seen it only after he's attended to a funeral? Or, there's some day or date that I associate with this. As if his body were being taken over by somebody else. But she never told me. And I never told anybody. Not even Mother. It's just something I observed and kept to myself. Friday. It was always on a Friday. Any Friday? Every Friday? No. Only when a Friday fell on the 13th of the month. Oh, that sounds like 16th century superstition. Well, it's quarter to 11. I'll have to reheat everything. Where could he be? Judith, I've looked high and low even in the attic. He's not there. The cellar? No, he's not there either. You looked, of course, in Mother's room. Oh, I didn't go in. I tried the knob. The door's locked. I expected it would be. Besides, what would Father be doing in there? You're sure it's locked? Oh, yes. Don't you remember Dr. Kodai said if someone dies of the plague, their room should be not used for a long time? I expected it would be locked. Hmm... I'm trying to piece the puzzle together. This afternoon, when we got here, and he came to the door, what was he doing carrying a tray with plates of soup, a bottle of wine, and glasses? Well, he must have had a visitor. At least one, but it's certainly not Dr. Kodai, because he always puts his doctor's black bag and his cane right in the hallway when he comes here. I suppose he could be in Mother's room. Well, why don't you try? Uh, call out to him through the door. He won't listen to me. Oh, we've waited supper long enough for him. I think we should go on upstairs to our rooms and go to sleep. It'll be time enough tomorrow morning to find out what this is all about. Now, you go on up to bed, Judith. I'll uh, sit here by the fire a little longer. I'm not that sleepy anyway. Maybe Father will turn up. What is it, do you suppose? What's wrong? Everything's wrong. We know that. I don't think I can go to sleep, but... Do you hear that? He's just come out of Mother's room. I recognize his step coming down the hall. Oh, no, I can't leave now. Uh, we'll uh, pretend to be having a deep conversation here by the fire. Well, hello, you two. I thought you had gone back to Budapest. Uh, not at all, Father. We uh, came up to spend the weekend with you. It is very late. Shouldn't you two be off to oh, bed? Father, Judith and I are both 24 years old. Well, actually, I'm 10 minutes younger than Stefan. He keeps forgetting I was born 10 minutes after he was. Um, anyway, I was going to bed. Are you sure you're feeling all right, Father? Of course I am, little one. I'm sorry I was abrupt before. It was just that um, I had something on my mind. Oh, we understand. We really do. It's been a long time since I kissed you goodnight, but I think I'll start that habit again. Good night, Father. Good night, Judith. Now, uh, listen, you, uh, close your door, will you? Your room's next to mine, and you know you snore. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> Good night. Well, uh, I guess I'll be turning in, too. Uh, Father, uh, we made some supper. It's in the kitchen. Would, would you like me to heat it up for you? No, thank you, my son. I am not hungry. Well, I don't know. A couple of bowls of soup and a bottle of wine doesn't have much nourishment. For heaven's sake, can't you forget that? Forget what I saw with my own eyes? It, it, it doesn't matter to me, Father. This is your house. If you have guests, what concern is that of mine? Who said there was anyone here? I know, Father, nobody was here or is here. And if they're gone, obviously they didn't leave by the front door. Judith and I have been in the house since five. And that means they left by the French doors that lead from Mother's room to the garden. Now, Father, as I said, it's your house. You are not accountable to me or to anyone. Stefan. Stefan, if... If I could take you into my confidence, if I could share certain things with you, it would ease my burdens. I know that. But I cannot. No one can bear this but myself. It is mine alone. <laughs> A little before midnight. Listen, something is going on in Mother's room. Well, how do you know? My room is right above hers. I can hear voices. Can you slip on a robe and come back with me to my room? 
I want you to listen with me. Will, will you? How long have you been hearing it? It woke me up. I'm sure there are two people. Men and father. I don't hear anything from down there. Neither do I. They just stopped talking, that's all. But I'm sure they're in there. What part of your room did the voices sound the loudest? Right under my bed. That's what woke me. Now, I'll tell you what we'll do. Help me move the bed closer to the window. And then we'll get on the floor and listen. Will you? All right. Okay, now you take that, that end of the bed and I'll take this end. Now, watch your feet. There's a small rug under it. So don't trip. You ready? I'm ready. I'll say one, two, three, lift. And we both move the bed all the way over to the window, okay? One, two, three, lift. <laughs> under the bed. Uh, look. There are cracks in the floorboards. I can see light coming up from Mother's room. Maybe it isn't right to spy on one's own father. But if he has people in this house and doesn't think enough of us to trust us with a secret, I think we're entitled to know. When people meet in secret in the middle of the night, what do you think? I'm thinking of father and the shock of losing Mother. And his hair turning white in a few days. And how ashamed I'd be if he knew what I was doing. And you just stop that. Look down there. What do you see? I see... Two men sitting at that table in the middle of Mother's room. They're all dressed up. They're wearing black suits. But I can't see Father. Oh, I could hear his voice before. Maybe he went out. <laughs> This room is opening. You were a long time, Peter. I had to go to the cellar, General. I keep my best wines in the cellar. Will you join us in another glass of wine, Professor? Happy to. I'm very cold, you know. I'm surprised you have any physical sensations at all, Professor. I don't. Not the one. Well, it is different for different people. Of all those who have stopped here on their way, some have no general sensations at all. Others do. They feel everything. I thought perhaps it had something to do with our waiting here in this room now, instead of as we used to do in that little stone house at the end of your garden. Well, it's better here. Easier to get to from across the road. Another midnight. I wonder how many I have yet to go. Aren't you going to sit down with us, Peter? Uh, in a minute. I want to lock the door first. Lock the door? Why? My son and daughter are visiting the general. Would they be wandering about this house at this hour? We are safer behind the locked door. Well, gentlemen, professor, general... I raise my glass of wine to your health. <laughs> That's an amusing statement, isn't it, General? How so? To drink to our health is, I would say, about the most ironical toast anyone could propose, considering we are gathered here on uh, borrowed time, as it were. Tell me, where are we? I think of it as a way station. Somewhere off the main track, a spur, a resting place. Professor, I don't know how you feel about it, but I would like to reward Peter for the care and understanding he has given us. Oh, no. No, I could not accept anything. I never have. General, you are right. Let me just think. What do I have on me at this moment that might be worth something? No, no, gentlemen, no, please. What I am doing is through no desire of my own. I fell into the job, you might say, as easily as one might trip into a grave. But uh, I was wondering if it might not pass the time more agreeably if the three of us played some cards. Yes. What say to three-handed poker? We could do that. Professor, what do you say? Why not, it would be the first time I've played a game and had nothing to lose. Stay where you are, gentlemen. I will go and fetch some playing cards. Judith! Yes! Yeah. 
Let's crawl over to the far side of the room. I, I want to talk to you. Wait. I'll put the rug back over the floorboards just in case we might be overheard. They were dead, weren't they? Both of them. Oh, I recognized the professor right away. I didn't know the other man. The general? I think I read about him dying a month ago. It's unbelievable. Quite unbelievable. Oh, I can remember so well. Two weeks ago, after class, we were all talking about the professor passing away so quickly. Don't you? I can see it so clearly in front of me. His picture in the paper that day. Professor Martin Hogar dies. Services will be held at the church in Callanan where he lived. Oh, he was the university's most prominent professor. He's supposed to be dead. If he is dead, then he must be an it. The other one, the uh, general. I wonder how long has he been out of his grave? And what are they doing here? I just cannot believe that you and I, Judith, two mature 24-year-old people are sitting up here looking through the floor at the dead coming to life. Well, it's happening. It's not a nightmare. If it is, I don't want to wake up yet. It isn't. I have to know more. It's our own father. And who can we ever talk to about this? Can you bear to have another look? Yes, I can. All right. We'll crawl back, take up the rug, and... You're sure, Judith, you're up to it? There are too many questions left unanswered. For me, to half know something is much worse than knowing all of it. Oh, as it is. How am I going to see Father in the morning and pretend I don't know anything? Oh, maybe there's an explanation I can understand. I pray there is. Strange that you should say you pray for an explanation. I pray too, Judith. But it's not too late for prayer. So we're at a way station, as Peter the grave digger tells us. A spur off the track that leads from life to death. Can it be there are those placed on the earth who still have time? Still have lifeless hours owing them? Could it be that there are way stations near other cemeteries? in other countries. It's something to ponder. But I wouldn't give it much thought too late at night if you happen to be alone walking past the graveyard. I shall return shortly with Act Three. This tale of the dead who are not completely dead goes back generations. It has inspired many versions, and in fact was told to me as his own invention by my own grandfather. In a room at night, twin brother and sister watch through the cracks in the floor an incomprehensible scene, that of their father, a general, and a professor. The latter, too, appear to have risen from their graves and are seated at a table. Peter, I want you to have my diamond shirt stuff. It is yours. Professor, please, no. Shall I deal the cards? Uh, the cards can wait. I want you to have this diamond shirt stud. Professor, on what occasion is a grave digger going to wear a diamond shirt stud? What good would it do? Uh, I might ask you the same question. What good will the silly thing do to me where I am going? Your family thought you should be buried with it. Uh, they won't be disappointed. They won't know. Peter, you are spending money on me. The wine, the food. That makes no difference. I... I told you that I felt the cold, didn't I? I will shuffle the cards. Did anyone hear what I said? Yes, Professor. You said you felt the cold. I now feel something else. Will you cut the cards, General? I would be happy to. I now feel anger. I don't wish to play. You two can play. I don't care to. Professor, I am sorry about the diamond. If it makes you feel better, I will accept it with thanks. I know I'm not supposed to have any feelings, but I do. And that's it. I'm most grateful to you, Peter. I, I, I cannot feel otherwise. Professor, Peter is anointed. He cannot accept payment. I have been waiting here for release longer than you have, Professor. I know what you do not. Peter is not only the caretaker of our graves, but our souls. A poor caretaker, but I do as I am told. 
If in the lifetime of the deceased he has one outstanding debt to pay, I help him to pay it, that is all. Your diamond stud will help someone who is buried in a pauper's grave. Thank you. Gentlemen, what about our game of poker? We have a long night to wait. Peter, do you ever think what happens to us might happen to you? Oh, yes, I do. Not so much for myself, but uh, for my wife. I threw the last shovel full of earth on her grave a week ago Friday. Friday the 13th. Every day I wonder, is this the day I shall see her walking through those French doors from the garden? Wondering if there is a debt she feels she owes. Dreading what she will ask of me. Knowing she cannot rest until I have done her bidding. A gift to someone? Is that something to dread? There are those who demand I take a life so that they can rest in peace. That would mean your wife had an enemy. Someone who wronged her. Someone did. A great wrong. And she might call upon you for final payment? Peter... Can you tell us who wronged her? It was I. I wronged Magda. Oh, Stefan. I cannot watch or listen to any more. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll help you to your room. Would you? All of this we've heard is so awful. I'm afraid my legs won't carry me down the hall. You just lean on me, Judith. It's all a terrible strain. When, when I asked you to come and listen to what was happening below in Mother's room, I had no idea that it would come to this. Uh, Father. What are you two doing up this late at night? Uh, 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 Judith, uh, it didn't feel well. I, I brought her in here, and I, I was about to take her back to her room. Stefan, why is your bed pushed to the window and the rug rolled back? Is that light from the room below showing through the floor? What were you two doing here, listening? Watching what was going on below in your mother's room? And Judith had nothing to do with it. I I couldn't sleep. I heard voices, and I, I asked you... You to... asked your sister to help you spy on me? No, it wasn't really spying. You were so changed today when we came home. I, I, I thought there must be something wrong. How long have you two been up here looking down through the floor? Now, Father, can't you understand? We were worried. How long? It was about midnight when we looked first. So... So you know everything. No. No, we don't. We, we don't know anything. We don't understand anything. Father... Couldn't you explain it? There is nothing to understand. There is nothing to explain. What is, is. Now, I will thank you to put the rug and the bed back where it belongs, Stefan. And the three of us will talk in the morning. Gentlemen. We will have to keep our voices low. I'm afraid my son and daughter were awakened. I have told them nothing. I am not prepared to tell them anything. Peter, I am a general. An army man only. I know little else. Is there any way one can avoid this in-between time at the way station? Uh, yes, there is, yes. Have it put in your will? But the coroner is to pierce your heart through with a knife. Ah. <laughs> Had I known that. Look, I have my army knife with me. A retired general, they said, must be buried with his hunting knife. How did you die, General? Disgracefully. I fell off my horse. <laughs> and I broke my neck. And you, Professor... <laughs> There's someone at the French door. I will go. It may be an intruder. Give me your hunting knife, General. <sighs> Another one of us. Look at him. He's dressed in a winding sheet. Oh, I'm cold. Cold. Come inside quickly, sir. Wait, Peter, shut the doors. Hold the man's head, Peter. I will pour this wine down his throat to warm him. 
Peter, why are you standing there? Help me uncover his head. Good Lord. It's not... It is not a man, no. It is my wife, Magda. Oh, my dear lady. Here, drink this. Peter's own wine. Why couldn't you have been one of the souls who reaches heaven straight away without this? Peter, where am I? I pray this would not happen to you. Why am I here? This is my own room. What is the debt you owe, madam? Do you remember that? In the war against the Prussians, they sent the soldier across the trenches with a white flag of truce. I shot him dead. That was my debt. And Peter saw to it that what I had, my ring and so on, were given to the man's widow. But I still have to wait until they accept it as full payment. I am also waiting so I can return to my grave. You don't remember what brought you here, madam? No. Only dying suddenly. Dear madam, your husband Peter has been an angel of mercy. Not only to the general and myself, but to many. In time, you will remember what sin has to be paid. Dr. Kadali, thank you for seeing Stefan and me today. I'm sorry. I'm so late in getting back to my office. Uh, you've known Father longer than anyone else in Colorado. Uh, let me interrupt and come to the point. That cemetery across from our house, was it always there? No. No, your father bought the land many years ago. It was a pasture. Father owns the cemetery. D doesn't it have to belong to a church? He owns the land the church is on also. Is that possible? Kalaman is a very poor community. One doctor only. They were grateful to Peter to let them build the church on his land and use the pasture for his cemetery. Has the cemetery been sanctified? Sanctified? Has it been blessed? Is it a fit last resting place for those who die? Oh, I have no way of knowing. Uh, I always assumed it was. You told us Mother died of the plague. Have there been many cases of it? Hers was the only one. There is much elsewhere, but not here. You saw Mother every day? Except the day she died. Peter was with her to the end. I had given him medicine to alleviate the suffering. She suffered so. So, it was a blessing that her suffering ended in death. Your father loved her so. He could not bear to see her in such pain. So he may have given her all the medicine and perhaps hastened... I uh, never allow myself to think of that. And I could not blame him for that. <sighs> we must go now. Thank you, doctor. Will you do me a favor? Will you take this wreath which I wanted to place on her grave and put it there for me. I haven't had the time to do it. There are so many who need me. Of course, as soon as we get home, we'll do it. It could wait until tomorrow. It's quite dark already. Oh, we're quite used to walking at night. See, I have a lantern. We'll place the wreath tonight. <laughs> I'm beginning to see a reason for all the strangeness of last night. Oh, I'm not sure I'll ever understand. Is the wreath heavy? Uh, not really. Uh, hold the lantern higher, Judith. I, I think Mother's grave is behind this mausoleum. Uh, wait. Look. It's Father. He's stretched across Mother's grave. Uh, Father? Father, what is it? Uh, uh, Judith, uh, Help me turn him over. Look at his eyes! He's dead. Oh, my Lord. How? There's a knife in his chest. An army hunting knife. It's as if he were kneeling here 
and fell straight onto the knife. As soon as Dr. Kodali was summoned, he brought the two grief-stricken youngsters back to their house. They insisted he accompany them to their mother's room. On the table, there were many empty glasses and empty dishes. The room itself was also empty, and the French doors leading to the garden were wide open. Those unfortunate souls who may have stopped briefly at the way station had found their way back to final, lasting peace. I shall return shortly. A few lines from that master of the macabre, Edgar Allan Poe, will tell you how I feel about the tale just told. Remember? Hear the rolling of the bells, iron bells. What a world of solemn thought the monody compels. In the silence of the night, how we shiver with affright at the melancholy menace of their tone. They are neither man nor woman, they are neither brute nor human. They are ghouls. Our cast included Russell Horton, Norman Rose, Maya Dillon, and Bernard Grant. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. After all, someday you will marry and have children of your own. You might as well start practicing taking care of other people's. If you go to live in France, you might even marry a Frenchman. Me? Marry a Frenchman? Never. Remain in Paris? Leave you? Abandon Poland? Never. Father, I promise you. Those kinds of promises are made to be broken. One has no idea what time and fate can do to one's little schemes. Besides, that summer, I still had no idea what I wished to do with my life. All I knew was I had to learn somewhere. There was so much to know, and I knew so very little. This is Tammy Grimes, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time. Pleasant dreams.